corporal, you know, target of that blow. Satan's earthly representative. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, one more question then before we uh, open it up to the audience. Uh, I always try to tie the, the sex and the politics together. So I remember when I interviewed Sex is politics. When I interviewed you back in <laughs> 2003, it was right, or 2004, it was right at the beginning of the Iraq mm -hmm. War. And you said you were seeing a lot of uh, people writing, men writing about anal sex, penit receptive anal sex, getting screwed in the ass. Yeah. Uh, and you said that you had seen similar things at the beginning of the Gulf War in the early 90s. Uh, just wondering, what are you seeing now? Well, I don't have my perfect perch anymore because for 15 years I did a series called The Best American Erotica. There's some folks here who were authors in the book, like Mark and, um, and you. What's your name? Martha. Oh, Martha. Hi. Yeah, we haven't seen each other for a while. So I had some great writers in it. And the, the process of it, to pick the best, I really did want to be a total snob and pick people I thought were amazing. Um, but I also ended up doing a sociological survey of simply what came across the transom, right? You know, I, I, if I had published an anthropologist view of erotica, it would have looked a lot different. Like during those war years, it would have just been bend over boyfriend, you know, from page one to page 200. Uh, but I tried to, you know, for editorial sake, have some variety. And I would speak, as I did speak to you on, on the radio that time, that um, I felt like I was some sort of Jungian bell that got chimed every year. I would look at what spontaneously people were writing the most of. They don't know each other, right? They're not having a secret club where they all say, let's send such and such to Susie. But in times where we've faced a huge military aggression, I am overwhelmed with male submissive erotica. When the first few years I did BAE was the beginning of the 90s, and there was still this paralytic fear of AIDS, AIDS panic. And if you, you know, people now think vampires have just been around, but that was the beginning of the vampire and the bloodletting era. That is when it all started. I was like, why is everyone writing about cutting and biting and the blood and you know, and it's supernatural or it's like a combination of, of, of fantasy and realism, sort of you know, the way that true blood walks that line today. In fact, check it out. A lot of people don't realize this. The story, um, what do they call them? The person who writes the main story for true blood, they have a special title not showrunner, but like the story chief, BAE author, Best American Erotica author, um, Chris Offit. I remember looking at that and going, well, what do you know? These, um, these themes of sexual transgression and trust and that you give it all up and you put your life at stake you know, for a sexual connection, it went hand in hand with, um, with these you know, tremendous fears of death. I don't do that series any longer. You know, imagine what I'm missing, but I feel like I could make some kind of, uh, some kind of predictions if I just looked at the headlines and thought about it a bit. And I mean, where is the, the new, the, the class warfare thing that's happening in the country <laughs> and, and us, the, the end of the empire, you know, the, the decline of the Roman, you know, what, how is that affecting people's sexual appetites? I mean, if we thought about it a bit, I bet I could make a good guess. Yeah. Maybe that'll be, you, you guys have to guess. <laughs> well, we're all getting screw, screwed by the ruling class. I mean, <laughs> right. That's not pleasant. <laughs> no, that's not pleasant, but you get eroticize it somehow. All right, let's, uh, we've got about 15 or 20 minutes, so let's, uh, any questions from the audience? You want me to, you want to pick them or should I pick them? Um, I want to pick. Okay, go ahead. Okay. <laughs> It don't even have to be questions, comments, anything. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering if you know this this experience of, of being in the left and the and the sectarianism there, and then what happened when you got attacked by the anti-porn feminists. If if you saw parallels, or if you saw it came coming from the same thing, you started to talk a little bit about that. So, I have to say that one like kind of what is it? Um, 
evil uh, smirking smugness I have right now is because the right has been so powerful for so long, they are now ha and, and now they're facing these challenges. They're having horrible sectarian debates and expulsions and, and you know, fighting over crap. And I'm like, ha, 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 now let's watch you on the hot seat. It wasn't like, you know, I thought, oh, the left, everyone else is behaving in such a civilized fashion. Oh, it wasn't, it wasn't th that wasn't the case at all. Um, but now, say that one more time, the last thing you asked me. Oh, if you, if you saw parallels in the, in the movement. I mean, I'm just interested in, in here are two movements, and you see a lot of splits. And mm -hmm. Yeah, splits well, and the biggest parallel was the hypocrisy, and, in, and particularly in the sense of my youth and naivete, the way I would earnestly believe these arguments and feel like I just, oh, if they, oh, I just have to prove myself. Oh, if I could only just, you know, show this, and, and I'm going to, you know, I'll, I'll show that what I'm doing is good and right and whole, you know, the right thing to do, and then they'll see that I'm not a coward and a traitor and, and have my heart in the right place, and I understand you know, I, just this ridiculous earnestness. And then find out that you know, this person who had been so high-handed and strict with you was doing fuck, you know, whatever the hell they wanted. You know, uh, whether it was enjoying luxuries or, or little special things that you were denied, or you know, that it was a it was a power. And Catherine McKinnon likes to get her hair pulled. <laughs> <laughs> well, exactly. And the idea that she was getting her hair pulled when I was alone at home without a date, driving me crazy. You know, uh, these uh, those kind of um, um, realizations. You know, somebody wrote a a, a little something about this book and I liked how they paraphrased my title instead of worrying it to death they said big sex little death that's growing up and letting go you know it's 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 huge expectations and and reality checks and and what you're left with at the end of it kind of following up from Jenny's question though like with the clans clansmen or the 357 magnum dude <laughs> He was trying to protect something. He was trying to protect a certain sense of racial and gender privilege. Oh, yeah. the, the Teamster thugs trying to protect their power and position. What were the anti-porn feminists trying to protect? What threatened them? They have, I mean, I mean these people are in charge of the anti-trafficking um, um, memes today. They have a little bit of money and they have a little bit of power and prestige. And what's left of, of an organized women's movement is so concentrated in the hands of such few people and they protect it, you know, with ha hammer and tong. You know, it's, it's uh, so to, when you're saying what they're protecting, um, it's the same, it's turf. It's a turf war. Did you go to Catholic school? Uh, I, I did go to Catholic school for a, for a wee bit. My, my mother was just so nutty about it. Like, we'd go into church. She's like, you, you know, you should be, you should have this education. And then she'd sit there in the pews and look at the priest and go, you bastard. You know, so it's just like, that's just the classic Irish thing. You're just like talking out of both sides of your mouth. And, and so I had two years at St. Rita's. And I'm going to tell you a good story about that that is not in the book. I, um, somehow people tracked me down who knew that, I had become a little well known and invited me to a St. Rita's reunion. And the, my memories of being with these kids were profound. And um, we got together and we were all talking about, yeah, remember when Sister Corrine lined all the boys up against the fence and smeared dog shit on everyone's face? No one could even remember why anymore. It was just done. Um, and, uh, and the kid who got in the most trouble and got beaten the most, I went up, I remember I slapped him. I mean, I became a violent little wretch along with everybody else. I remember, yeah, I, I remember coming up to him at the reunion and saying, this is funny to apologize for. I know we were only 10, but i um, really sorry I raised my hand against you. Um, and he just, he and his wife, she was holding his hand really tight the whole time. She said, it's a big deal for Scott to be here today. Um, the real story was that he was being beaten at home, it, it really like worse than any of us. And you know how you get when you're a kid, you just feel like this magnet, like everyone is sort of like, kick me, that you know, you become, it's your modus operandi. And I don't know, every, I never get sick. 
of the exposés and the expulsions that we see in the news today. What's the, I mean, the last one before I left town was in Philadelphia. I, um, Emma, you're looking cross-eyed at me. I got the wrong. No. It's hard to keep up with them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, people are like, oh, are you blasé? No, I am not fucking blasé. And it's an incredible um, sense of, of reparation, and it's got to come out. Uh, I've, I'm going to be interviewed by a couple of Irish newspapers and broadcasters this next week. I can't wait to hear what they're going to ask me um, about all of this. And... Um, because I feel like it's, it's part of the church. The idea that they're still acting like it's an accident instead of programmatic blows my mind. Actually, a couple of statisticians uh, did a study recently that projects that Ireland, religion will disappear in Ireland and about six or seven other countries sometime in the next decade or, or two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, purely on the basis of statistical extrapolation, not sociology. <laughs> that and the snakes, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> It was very sweet when the, the two ex-nuns, though, came and bought a vibrator from you. Yes, yeah, those are those other stories. All these things that you say, I find myself still flinching, like, yeah, I wrote that, but you know, I still have such sympathy for all the people I, I criticize. It's a tricky thing as a memoirist. Yeah, you ha right behind the pillar, is somebody waving? Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think it was you, but someone else on Doug's show suggested that this might not even be hypocrisy. It's actually a real elitism. Was it you, actually, that said something like that? Yeah. That beyond just that they think there's one standard for them and one standard for someone else. They actually think that they're better and these people really deserve it. And I remember thinking, you know, I'm attending law school right now and some of these people really want to go on to be prosecutors and they have, you know, life histories of, you know, drug use and doing whatever they want. And they really think that, you know, there's one standard. It's not even, a, it's worse than hypocrisy. It's a real, like, elitism. And something like that. I'm so glad you brought that up because I was talking to uh, someone who works uh, on drug law reform. And we were having the same conversation, and she said, uh, it's the same thing with all these people who are like, you know, stop drugs, and like, they get as fucking high as they want. You know, like it's, you know, and everything is, it's wide open. And these, these vice measures, whether it's sexual speech, which is always the first speech to be censored, the exception that's made to every rule, you know, is like, oh, it was sexual, oh my God, you know. But well, that's got to stop. Um, to this sense of creating public policy defined by fundamentalists who, who truly feel like it, this mirrors their elitism, their top-down, you know, daddy knows best, daddy gets to have the porn collection, but you don't. Um, it, it, it goes on and on, and, and it, it's so frightening to people to think that maybe a democratic litmus test has sexual politics, you know, right there. That is your boiling point. I mean, why not start there? Hi, yeah. What's the toughest thing about writing the book? Oh, gosh, the toughest thing. Have you written a memoir or written autobiographically? Uh, no, I haven't. Oh. Um, hmm. Okay, what was the best thing? No, 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 no. Like, just like, how, how right or wonky do you want to get? Um, I would say not the worst, but like in terms of tough, when you write something well, on one hand, I would have the rush that it had worked. And on the other hand, it's like going through it again, like some kind of, like, you know, one of those Christmas Carol Dickens ghosts that like, you know, takes you right through it and you have to see it and feel it so realistically again. Uh, and I would leave my writing room, you know, and the, the cat, the dog, the kid, everyone's screaming and wanting something. And I'm like, but you don't understand. It's 1974. <laughs> you know, like, 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 I, I'm still in my, I, I, I'm still caught there. And, uh, but it was well worth it. It was both the hardest part, but like, so good to do that. And I went through, and yes, Martha, and I went through it again, reading it out loud when I did the audio book for Audible. My goodness, reading the thing from front to back, that was also a, whew, you know, wipe your 